we propose a new semi-automatic method that uses topological features to guide users in tracing neurons and integrate this method within a virtual reality framework. We use the more smell complex to find a set of candidate neuron arcs. The candidate arcs are integrated into a VR neuron tracing system and exposed through a more smell complex guided semi-automatic tracing tool. The topological ridge graph underlying our MSC guided tool is robust against gaps in the signal. Visualizing class separations is using applications such as classification and clustering. However, many dimension reduction techniques are limited due to the issues of separability and interpretability. We propose a visual analytics framework to support the exploration of nonlinear complex separation structures with the power of locally linear separations. How do you visualize the nanoscale, one billionth of a meter for the public? As part of a Science Center exhibition, we developed an immersive environment that explains nanoconcepts by allowing users to explore nanoproperties. We reflect on how exploration, the confluence of explanatory and exploratory visualization, can be applied to visualization in public spaces. The success of a cultural neural network has been attracting many students and practitioners to learn the exciting technology. However, for beginners, the CN model is not easy to understand. We introduced the explainer, an interactive realization tool to help beginners more easily learn about convolutional neural network. Using the explainer, users can progressively explore the CN model with real-life images in their browser. Getting a comprehensive understanding of both high-level model structure and low-level underlying mathematical operations. As data is changing, our understanding of data should be updated correspondingly. Based on machine learning approaches, we formulate a drift level index to monitor the evolution of multi-source data, which allows users to capture and reason significant changes from time series data. The proposed visual analytics system is called Concept Explorer. More details can be found in our talk. As commonly known, dimensional interreduction techniques and their interpretations are complex, biased, and uncertain. In drug design, this highly complicates the search for similar and new chemical compounds. To overcome this issue, Canva brings comparison of different molecular descriptors and properties into one tool, featuring planar, 3D, and table views for evaluating the trustworthiness of high-dimensional data projection.
Scatter plots and parallel coordinates are widely used for visualizing multivariate discrete data. However, for multivariate continuous data, the continuous scatter plots and continuous parallel coordinates are more suitable. In this work, we extend them to uncertain data. Additionally, we also extend fibers to uncertain data. If you are interested, come to our presentation. In this talk, we introduce CallFlow, an interactive visual analysis tool that provides a high-level overview of performance profiles from large-scale scientific applications. CallFlow visualizes the flow of resource of a program execution as a Sankey diagram to detect performance bottlenecks in parallel codes. CallFlow simplifies these calling context trees based on semantic information by constructing supergraphs. Linking and brushing is very useful for interactive visual data exploration. Data-driven brushing tools are getting popular recently and achieve good results, for example the Mahanodobis brush and the CN-based brush. However, these brushing tools are optimized by the data from a large number of users, which are not suitable for everyone. In this paper, we introduce an adaptive brush model which takes the user in a loop to improve the brushing accuracy. We present the first generic design space and library for visual piling. Inspired by physically piling paper documents, Visual Piling describes an interface for spatial organization of visual artifacts into piles of partially overlapping items. Piling affords interactive grouping, arrangement, previewing, browsing and aggregation to reduce the complexity and support comparison of large collections of small multiples. If machine learning were like education, we would like to test what concepts our student, the model, has learned. Has it learned the concept of object rotation? Does additional text help with object recognition? We need a methodology and platform for conducting such tests. In this paper, we present a novel visual analytics tool that enables hypothesis-based evaluation of machine learned models. Carrick's S is an authoring system which enables rapid creation of zooming-based scatter plot-like visualizations in just tens of lines of JSON. We contribute a declarative grammar for such visualizations, which captures a large design space. By working with multi-node database spatial indexes, Carx S enables interactive browsing of billions of data points. Come listen to our talk to learn more. While meetings are an essential part of everyday business life, most calendar visualizations are not designed for retrospection. We present a tool consisting of four coordinated views that integrate into the user's daily workflow and are designed to promote self-awareness about past scheduling decisions. We discuss the insights gained from an internal user study and from a field deployment. We also discuss how we strongly inherit from the principles of personal visual analytics despite targeting a professional environment. In this study, we designed a system named Causality Explorer to facilitate the causal analysis. Users can explore the causal graph to perceive the causality and it is uncertainty, validate the causality with the raw data, and apply the confirmed causality to what-if analysis. Pixel Clipper allows visitors to quickly and expressively extract visual clippings from visualizations and add comments to them. The clippings are useful for engaging the public with complex data sets because they are entry points into the visualization. This can be applied in a wide range of engagement experiences, such as the use of facilitated and ambient displays at public engagement events. Progressive visual analytics provides intermediate results in the middle of computation to address a long computational delay. However, such intermediate results are uncertain, so findings from these results can turn out to be incorrect for the entire data. In progressive visual analytics with safeguards, we suggest to risk the uncertainty, but we allow humans to leave safeguards every time they risk the uncertainty. Thank you.
In our paper, we address the problem of navigating complex multiscale and dense environments, such as these molecular models. We present a technique for browsing a model by clicking on textual labels, which we call hyperlabels. This allows the user to intuitively navigate the hierarchical organization of the model. For more details, read our paper or watch the talk. With the proliferation of AutoML systems, it's now easier than ever for known experts to create and deploy any trained machine learning pipelines. These systems explore the model search space and optimize hyperparameters in order to solve a particular task. We propose Pipeline Profiler, a tool that enables the exploration and comparison of machine learning pipelines produced by multiple AutoML systems. By analyzing these pipelines, we have the opportunity... Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to session two of the VAST Challenge. Uh, my name is Curtis Larimer. I'm from Pacific Northwest National Laboratory, and I'm going to give you an overview and an introduction to Mini Challenge One. We decided to go a little out of order in terms of presenting the Mini Challenges this year to uh, help some of our presenters um, in, across the different time zones. So mini challenge one was our graph analysis challenge. Um, we provided a large uh, set of data um, that was mod modeled as a property graph. Uh, and this was data that represented the, the actions, the behaviors, the transactions of a large group of hackers worldwide. And the challenge was to identify a small group uh, in that, that large graph data that matched a structure that we provided, a sort of key. Um, and this challenge basically broke down into, into two types of tasks. So the first was to compare uh, two smaller graphs uh, in order to see if uh, where they were similar, if they were similar to one another. And the second task was uh, 
to identify a potential match to a, a, a small graph if they were given that template, uh, but only given either a starting seed within the big graph, so a single transaction, uh, two nodes and one edge, or by exploring the, the big graph without any specific starting point. So the data that was provided was a, a large graph um, containing six different channels. Um, that means uh, six different types of edges. So this was email an email channel, a phone channel, a purchase channel, which is split into buying and selling, a travel channel, and a demographic channel. The demographic was a little bit unique in that it was a bipartite uh, graph. Uh, where each of the people in the other channels um, had a sort of number of edges to different categories in which they um, have spent uh, money on, on different basic items. So we, uh, we provided a template graph. This was the key to this challenge. And it was a model of what uh, our cybersecurity researchers had thought our, uh, our white uh, hat group would look like. And um, we provided some candidates graphs uh, in that the participants were supposed to compare to that key or that template uh, through their visualizations. And then of course we provided a big graph and this is where um, the real meat of the challenge uh, came out um, because this graph had close to 124 million uh, records uh, represented in a, in a compact uh, edge list format. For one of the questions, we provided a few seeds, just as I mentioned, a, a single edge, uh, two nodes and an edge uh, that could be used as a starting point uh, so that the teams could, the participants could explore that big graph uh, and build out a potential match. So this data, uh, we had the benefit of some recent research at, at, at PNNL in synthetic graph generation that used a motif-based approach. Uh, for some years now, uh, my institution has uh, recorded some of our institutional uh, operational data, things like our emails and phone calls, and uh, anonymized that and made it available for research. Now, the data that we released isn't uh, the data about uh, our own uh, communications, but we uh, learned from that data the types of motifs and patterns that are in it, uh, and then sort of made a reflection uh, in, of course, a much larger group. So my institution has fewer than 5,000 um, people, but the big graph that we provided uh, had close to 100,000, uh, the, the transactions of close to 100,000 people. So the questions that we asked of the participants were first, to uh, build a visual analytic uh, tool to compare that template subgraph, that key, with five potential matches that we provided. Now, I should say that during the, the uh, data generation, we not only created the large graph, which had uh, 125 million records, but we also created five near matches to our template and we embedded them in the large graph okay so tried to stitch it in so that it would look seamlessly like part of the background three of those near matches were used in this first question uh, and so we provided three matches uh, as well as two additional ones and our question was to show uh, where the template and those five graph graphs uh, agreed and where they disagreed, parts where they matched and, and parts where they did not. And to identify which key parts would help discriminate it from the other potential matches. Now, the second question was slightly more difficult because we didn't provide an entire subgraph, but instead just one, one starting point. And in order to build out a match, the participants had to um, look into the large graph and do so sort of piece by piece. The third question was um, listed as optional, and there's a good reason for that. Um, because in this 
uh, question, we asked participants to find a match to the, to the template without any guidance, without uh, any indication of where to start. Um, this in computer science um, is known as an NP complete problem, um, a, a extremely uh, difficult computational challenge uh, because uh, finding that uh, matching subgraph um, is so difficult. So in question four, we actually asked, based on the answers to the previous three questions, which group participants really thought was responsible? Which was the best match to the key that we had given? And then question five, as we've done across the many challenges, was more of a, a process question. Um, how did you work with the large graph data? What was the difficulty um, that was encountered? How was that overcome? Um, you may recall, if you're a, a past participant of the VAST challenge, that in 2018, we also had a large graph mini challenge. Uh, and um, we had relatively fewer uh, participants uh, submissions against that challenge. And so we wanted to understand where the difficulties um, may have been coming from. So in the next few slides, I'm going to go through the solution, and then we're going to go ahead um, to see some of the really excellent submissions from this year for this year. So uh, in our question one, um, recall I said that we used three graphs um, that were near matches. Um, and graph one was actually the closest to being a complete match um, to the template of the five candidates that we provided. Graph two was also a, a, a nearly complete match, but we had sort of pulled away, stripped out some of the uh, the edges. Graph three was also a complete match, but this had been cut by almost half. So a lot of the matching edges were removed. And then graphs four and five were really just random selections from the background. So those should not have been found to be close matches by, by any of the participants. On question two, we provided a number of seeds, and only one of those seeds actually uh, was part of something that could be thought of as a, as a near match to the to the template, and that was seed one. And then for question three, um, for those who were brave enough, willing enough to go forward into the the graph, the large graph, um, there was one near identical match to the template. You know, so this might be the part where you want to come back to the to the YouTube feed later and check these node IDs to see how close um, you, you got in your answer. The committee had some observations uh, on this year's submissions. Um, there were a number of really creative approaches to addressing um, the subgraph isomorphism problem. Again, this is a very difficult computational problem. Um, but several teams um, found ways to kind of uh, get hold of it and um, leverage their visual um, systems in order to find um, uh, really good solutions. Um, in particular, we noted that they were able to use some unique template characteristics that were a little bit more discriminative um, to find this, a starting point. And then they basically used their approach from question two uh, to find the solution. Um, we felt that this really demonstrated the power of combining the graph computation techniques with the visual analytics. Every year we get so many great uh, uh, submissions and it's hard to be able to provide an honorable mention or an award to all of them. Um, so sometimes we just like to highlight some um, really nice um, submissions. Um, this year there was a great submission from Luther College and Texas Tech, um, submission 1038. Uh, and uh, we wanted to highlight this for, for uh, this team for testing the applicability of an existing tool. Um, in, in many cases, um, our award winners are developing custom tools against the data that we provide. Um, uh, it can be almost an equal challenge to take an existing tool and try to uh, uh, adjust the data to fit into it. And um, sometimes that can, can also yield some really interesting results. So th that was a highlight um, for this team. 
Lastly, we'd also like to highlight a submission from uh, Otto von Gurich University and, and University of Jena, submission 1029. Um, the reviewers um, highlighted this team for using their visual analytics to divide and conquer uh, on the large graphs. Uh, obviously, um, a key task um, given how large that uh, graph was. And so you can see a, a sample of their visual, visualization there where they're showing um, the template and a, a number of matches they're comparing against along the top and then along the side, uh, a, a number of different ways in, the, in which they're dividing and comparing the, the graph. And so just another um, highlight from this year's submissions that unfortunately are not able to present today, um, but uh, reflect uh, the high quality of submissions that were sent this year. So now without um, further ado, I would like to um, introduce the first of our presenters and award winner for Mini Challenge One. Um, this award was given for um, an outstanding comprehensive Mini Challenge One solution. Um, it was su submission uh, 1030, um, a large team from a number of different um, institutions and um, this, as you'll see in their presentation, uh, was a, a team that really took on all of the challenges uh, in Mini Challenge 1, and um, they were able to answer all of the questions, got many of the, the um, uh, answers correct, but more importantly, they also um, uh, used some really novel visualizations to get to those uh, solutions. And so um, at this point, I'd like to um, start their video presentation um, and and as a reminder as you're watching this um, if you have questions or comments on the uh, presentation or on the submission um, please uh, post them in the discord channel um, you can also type your questions directly in the youtube chat um, those are going to be mirrored back and forth um, and so um, then at the end of the presentation i'll be able to read them and, and um, get some uh, question and answer with the submitter. So uh, th thank you, and now I'll, uh, we'll start the presentation. I am Alexis Pister. I am Gail Richer. And I am Paola Valdivi. We worked with Petra Eisenberg, Jean-Daniel Fekett, and Christophe Prieur to propose our vast 2020 Mini Challenge 1 solution that we called Graplet Matchmaker. We publish our solution as grapletmatchmaker.github.io you can see the video, the report, and live demo of our interactive tools in this website. In our solution, we combine multiple graph analysis and visualization approach to address three following tasks. The first task is comparing the graph structure between the template graph and candidate graph. The second task is trying to find the best matching subgraph in the last graph. Finally, we combine our approach in the first two tasks to identify the suspicious group that may be responsible for the internet outage. We propose three visualization and analysis methods to compare the graph structure in the first task, node link diagram, graph rate frequency, and temporal profile. Next, I will explain how we use this tool in our solution. The first thing we did with the graph data was creating node link diagram in B3.js to explore multiple kinds of nodes and edge in the graph data. Here is the screenshot of the two. We represent different kinds of nodes in different shapes. For the location, we observe that there is a single location for the phone call and assume that it is the original location of each person. We encode the location as the node color. The edge can be selected from the checkbox panel. From these two, we found that there are two groups in the template graph. The first group is connected by dense communication when we filter email and phone relationships. The second group is connected with the similar traveling patterns when we filter travel to relationship. You can see from the graph that most of the nodes are person nodes and there are only one co-authorship and one product. Interestingly, that product connects with only one buyer and one seller and they have multiple edge of procurement transaction 
as well as communicate by email to each other. Overall, compare the template with candidate graph. Graph 1, 2, and 3 seem to have the same pattern. But it is difficult to tell which one is the most similar to the template graph. My friend Alexi is working on graphic approach to figure out which candidate graph is the best match. We studied the structure of the given networks using graphlets. Graphlets are small induced subgraphs composing any network which give information on the local and global structure of the graph. We use the graphlet frequencies to compare the template and the candidates on a global and node level, but also to find potential matches in the peak graph using the frequencies as a basis for a node distance measure. Graphlets can be of various sizes, directed or not. We mainly used undirected graphlets of size 5 for interpretation reasons. We compared the normalized graphlet frequencies between the template and the candidates. The Pearson coefficient shows the level of correlation between each candidate and the template. We can see that graph 4 and 5 have a very different graphlet profile compared to the template. In contrary, graph 2 has similar frequencies to the template, with a coefficient of 0 0.76. The most common subgraph is the same, which is a four size click with an additional node. Graph 1 and 3 are a bit less correlated, but are not that much different than the template. We also compared the graphlet frequencies at the node level. Although we can see some similarities between the graphlet frequencies of some nodes, it is hard to find specific identical pair of nodes between the template and the candidates. Graphlets allow a static analysis of the graphs, which are dynamic in our case. This is why Paola did a temporal analysis of the networks. We analyzed the temporal activity for the graphs using visualization at different aggregation scales. In this visualization, we show the edges of each node as circles colored by its type. For example, blue circles represent emails and orange circles represent phone calls. In this case, we see two peaks of communication in the template graph. But looking at the temporal activity of the other graphs, we notice similar peaks in graph 1 and graph 2, but not in graph 3. We create a time series for each graph by counting the daily activity. We can then compare graphs visually and also measure the difference in activity between graphs. In these aggregated views, the most similar candidates were also graph 1 and 2. Even though none of, none of these graphs present an activity peak in the middle of the year, graph 1 and 2 both have an increase of communication then high peak followed by only travel activity. However, the peak activity from graph 2 is closer in size to the one of the template graph. Using the dynamic time warping distance, we calculated the pairwise distance of the aggregated time series between all graphs. According to this measure, graph 2 is more similar to the template graph. To match the nodes in the template graph and candidate graph, we use several similarity measures to find nodes that had the same properties. So far, we introduced graphlet similarity and temporal distances. Next, NatCommon will introduce two more similarity measures that compare demographic profiles and travel itineraries profiles. For demographic profile, we looked at the data and found that different financial categories have different range of value. As you can see, some categories like money income before tax, market payment, and personal tax highlight in red box have an extremely high value. We transform the data with the standard score to construct the demographic profile of each person node. Standard score allows us to see who spend or receive money more or less than the average of a particular category. Next, we calculate the similarity score between every two person pairs of the template and candidate graph using cosine similarity measure. For travel age, we construct the travel itinerary profile of each person as a set of tuple from sort location to target location. You can see in the graph where we encode the trip profile of each person as a dot. We calculate the jet guide similarity coefficient of trip made to measure the similarity between two person nodes. Afterwards, we tried to find good matches inside the large graph using pairwise node comparisons. We followed three different approaches, using seeds as a starting point for a crawling algorithm, focusing on specific patterns, and using a manual matching tool. 
First, we developed a greedy matching algorithm to find good possible matches from the seed, using any node distance measure. We first initialize a candidate set of nodes and fill it with all the neighbors of the seed using the communication channels. The pair of nodes which have the highest similarity value between the template nodes and the candidate nodes is matched. The candidate set is then updated with the neighbors of the latest matched node in the large graph. We repeat the process until all nodes of the template have been matched. We used several distance measures using demographics, travel, and graphlets. However, for the graphlet distance, the degree distribution is not the same between the template and the large graph. Thus, we cannot compare the node graphlet frequencies directly between the template and the big graph. To still compute a graphlet distance, we sampled a population of subgraphs from the big graph, with the same size than the template. Each node of the big graph appears several times in this subgraph. It was then possible to compute for each node a distribution of frequencies for each graphlet. But we can compare with the frequencies of any template node. To have a distance, we computed how many times the frequency of each graphlet for the node of the template was inside the distribution of the same graphlet frequencies for the node of the big graph. However, the majority of the template nodes are not included in all channels. For example, we can see that only a few nodes have communication and travel edges. Thus, we combine several distances together by using their means to find matches relevant to several channels at the same time. Here are the graphs found from seed 1 using various distances. We can see that a highly connected component is always found, similar to the one in the template. However, the rest of the subgraphs seem to vary. The graphs found from seed 3 look similar than with seed 1. However, this visualization only allows to compare the graphs globally. How to evaluate the extracted graphs in more depth? To evaluate how good a graph match was and to compare strategies, we developed the node matching view. Each pair of match nodes is represented by a column with at the top the template node and at the bottom the candidate node. Each line of squares represents a distance computed between the match nodes. A dark blue square indicates a distance value of zero. The green arcs represent the retrieved edges of the communication channel, while the red edges are not retrieved. Here are the two subgraphs found from the seeds 1 and 3 using a combination of the demographics and travel distances. This is the distance measure which gave the best results. The demographics and travel distance are very low, which shows that the matching nodes often have similar profiles. The graphlet distances vary more depending on the nodes. We can see that the two subgraphs share a lot of edges with the template, but a lot are missing as well. To have a starting point for matching nodes in the large graph, we decided to focus on the buyer product seller pattern. In particular, we focus on the buyer since it had connections with several other people and has also traveled to some countries. We visualize the ego network of the buyer where we can see their in and out connections through time. We can see their communication exchanges and buying and travel activity. This is summarized in this other visualization where we use different glyphs for each edge type. We counted nine transactions for this person. So we decided to search for buyers on the large graph. And we focus on the three candidates who bought at least seven products from the same person. We compare visually each candidate from the large graph with the buyer from the template graph. We use a heat map to compare the demographic profile and aggregate the temporal bars to compare their activity through time. In this case, the first and second candidates are bad matches. The third candidate's demographic profile and the template nodes profile were very similar. Even further, we noticed that there was a one-to-one -one correspondence of the purchase products and that the travels from the template node were also in the candidate. We concluded that this is a good match. From these observations, we knew demographics profile and travels were a good way for finding matching nodes on the large graph. So we extracted the nodes with matching demographic profiles and added all the edges between them. Then we added the nodes with matching travel patterns. 
this view that we introduced before shows the agreement between the template and the final match. Even if there are some differences in the travel distances, overall, the final match is almost perfect relative to communications between people. The phone locations represented by the color of the circles is also perfectly matched, and the distance between demographic profiles is very low. We've seen that building an efficient crawling strategy using distance metrics is difficult. However, in some cases, nodes can be visually matched with confidence, and metrics remain useful to narrow down the number of possibilities to look at. This motivated us to build this manual matching tool using both distance metrics and visual representations. In this example, we start with a candidate graph extracted from the large graph around the buyer-seller pattern. On the top, we see summary views for the template graph, one showing the structure, the other showing temple activity. On the bottom, the views are the same, but for the match graph. Initially, the match graph contains the buyer-seller pattern plus the country nodes. On the right, a table shows the list of possible node pairs with their distance along multiple metrics. We start by looking at node 47 because it is connected to the match nodes and also involved in a pair with promising results. By clicking on the pair, we can inspect its similarity through detailed views that appear on the bottom. We see that the demographic heat maps are highly similar and that there is a shared pattern of communication events in the temporal bars. The views on the right look at the consistency of communication labels. Here, the inspected pair is in the middle and the two outgoing arcs are green and red, which means that the pair is consistent, consistent with one of the neighbors in the template. Overall, this pair seems like a good match. After accepting this pair, the table and the views on the left update to reflect the addition. Here, after matching some more nodes, we identify an interesting pair involving node 41. Since this node has several travel activities, we choose to filter the table to focus on it and sort the table according to travel similarity. Then, we inspect the two best pairs in detail because they have more promising travel scores than the others. We validate the first one because we are able to recognize the travel pattern around December on the temporal bars. To sum up, the tool allows to focus on node pairs based on different information. The node link diagram and temporal views show graph and temporal activity patterns, which can be used, for instance, to focus on uncollected nodes a node connected to match nodes, or a node with many travel events. The tables allows to focus on node pairs with promising score along one metric or another. Then, we can validate or reject node pairs after detailed inspection and iteratively compose a match for the whole template graph. Next, we apply visualization we developed to identify the group that may be responsible for the internet outage. To identify suspicious activity on the extract subgraph, we visualize aggregate time series and we saw a certain peak of communication in November. That led us to explore further what happened. Using the heat map plotting between day and hours, we observed that this peak happened after there was no communication for several days. Surprisingly, exchange of email and phone call in the two following days. So we look at the connection between people before and after the outcome. We observe a dense communication aid by both phone and email among a group of people two days after the event. So we suspect that those people were responsible for the outage. In conclusion, we apply multiple data analysis and visualization technique to address WAS 2020 Mini Challenge 1. First, to compare the graph structure, we propose node link diagram, graph by frequency, and temporal profile to evaluate the similarity between graphs. Second, to find matching subgraph in the large graph, we use node similarity measure to find matching node and found that demographic profile and travel itinerary led to a good result. Based on this finding, we develop a tool to manually compose a match for the template graph. Finally, we show that our approach for the first two tasks can be combined to identify the suspicious group in the last network. We thank the committee chair and reviewer for the award to this work, and thank you very much for your attention.
Okay, thank you. Uh, I have our pre presenter for the last talk um, with me now, and we have a few minutes for questions. Um, so I'll just read a couple of questions from the Discord chat. Uh, and the first came from Steve Gomez of MIT Lincoln Lab. Uh, are there cases where the graphlet analysis might make two large graphs seem similar, but where the local structures might be very different? Yes, in the last graph, actually, we try to calculate the graphlet for the for every dot in the graph, but the problem is that because in the in the last graph is hyperconnected, so the density of the graphlet pattern they are look like they they look they look all the same. So actually, Alexi devised the algorithm to try to make a random walk for the to calculate the graphlet. Otherwise. There are many, too, too many nodes to calculate the graphlet and the uh, computational result will crash. But in the end, we don't use the graphlet to match in the large graph itself, but we use the demographic profile, we use the other uh, node information to match the node. Yeah, yeah I, I felt like that was a really nice part of your submission, which is that it used a lot of different approaches to, to, to this matching. Um, so one of the next questions was, are, are the graphlets that you use sensitive to the node type, meaning do they distinguish between emails and phone calls? Uh, yes, uh, the, because we use the GTI scanner, it is the implementation of graphlet count. So right, so in, in, this, uh, in this library, they just like can handle only a single node type. But actually we found uh, the, the paper that consider the multi-type of nodes, but we don't have time to implement it yet. But it's actually a good idea to, uh, to try to calculate that based on considering multi-type of nodes. Great. I, I noticed that there's quite a few people um, saying it, you know, that it was a very nice talk. Um, and I just wanted to note that I really liked your um, node matching view. The, that visualization was really um, engaging. Um, it, it was helpful in matching um, the candidate and the, uh, the template matches. Um, I thought it sort of looked like an, an airplane uh, seat diagram, you know, like <laughs> yes. when you have to go, go choose your seat. So um, I wonder if you could just say what, what was sort of the inspiration for that visualization? The inspiration is that uh, we start as so we, we come with a different approach and then we try to use visualization to see what will lead to a good result in this, in this challenge. And one idea is that we assume that the, per, the same person should have the same demographic profile. So then we, we derive with the, with the similarity metric and then we, we derive the node matching view to find the way to match the node. And because uh, the graph uh, pretty look different in the, in the details, so we thought that, okay, let's start from the, the node that we are sure that is gonna be exactly matched and then we are, extend the result like step by step. And then uh, that's why in the end we derive this the matching to, to help us uh, to try to find the matching from the node that we believe that we are most confident it should be the same one and then we extend it one by one. Great, yeah, thank you. Um, you know, your a very impressive submission um, and your award for um, this mini challenge was well deserved. Um, so if there are more questions about this um, submission or this presentation, you can continue that on uh, the Discord chat. Um, but in the interest of time, we are going to move ahead um, and show the next uh, video. Okay. All right, we are ready for our next presentation on Mini Challenge 1, 
this submission won an honorable mention uh, from the committee and the uh, reviewers. Um, and this honorable mention was given um, because of this submission's streamlined analysis process. Uh, the submission came from Shandong University. Uh, it was submission number 1034, and we're going to hear from uh, Liu Yu Cheng. Um, so without further ado, uh, we will bring up the video. Hello, everyone. I'm Liu Yu from Ideas Lab, Shandong University, China. The title of my speech is CA2, Cyber Attacks Analytics, which aims to solve many challenge one of this year's vast challenge. My presentation is of five parts. First, I will briefly state tasks and input data. Second, I will give you a quick overview of our approach. Then, I will show you our system design and give a live demonstration. After that, I will introduce a workflow to find the real answer based on our system. Finally, I will summarize our works and Hello everyone, I'm Liu Yu from Ideas Lab, Shandong University, China. The title of my speech is CA2, Cyber Attacks Analytics, which aims to solve many challenge one of this year's vast challenge. My presentation is of five parts. First, I will briefly state tasks and input data. Second, I will give you a quick overview of our approach. Then, I will show you our system design and give a live demonstration. After that, I will introduce a workflow to find the real answer based on our system. Finally, I will summarize our works and talk about limitations and future works. Let's begin the first part. An anonymized Red Hat group accidentally launched a global internet outage. Our goal is to find the responsible group. Center of Global Cyber Strategy provides a very large social graph containing anonymized profiles of all wet hats. They also identify the structure of the responsible group and five potential groups. This information are also stored as graphs. We call them template graph and candidate graphs, respectively. According to the task, first, we must compare candidate graphs with a template graph to see if any one of them matches. Then, we have to find out the real responsible group in the large social graph. The very large graph has more than 100 million edges and 200,000 nodes. The template graph and the candidate graphs has very few edges and nodes. Candidate graphs are subgraphs of the very large graph. A node in the graph may represent a person, a product category, a financial category, a document, or a country. Ages represent activities, and ages may indicate a phone call, an email, authorship relation, demographics, trade with others, or travel in specific country. In this part, I will give an overview of our approach. To tackle the tasks, we must visualize these graphs. However, the size of the very large graph supersedes capabilities of many popular graph visualization softwares. And even if we could visualize the very large graph, seeking a 20-people group would be just like finding a needle in a haystack. So we designed and built a visual analytics system helping people to compare and match multiple graphs at the same time. The system makes use of every data channel and supports interaction across multiple views. 
so users can efficiently find out where graphs agree or disagree with each other. With a very analytic system, we found that although some of the candidate graphs are very similar to the template graph, some individual characteristics fail to agree. Therefore, we design a visual analytic workflow to find a similar subgraph from the very large graph. In this part, I will explain how we design each part of our visual analytics system. In the beginning, we keep three design rationalities in our minds. The first is comprehensiveness. Since every channel may play an important role when comparing, components in our system should cover all aspects of data. The second is being hierarchical. We should organize all components in a top-down hierarchy so that the user can find the components they want to use easily. The last rationale is to coordinate multiple views. Each component shouldn't work independently. So if users change and something in one component, related components should reflect the changes. Next up, I will give you a tour guide of our user interface design. First, we separate the viewport horizontally into three major parts. The control panel on the left, organization panel in the middle, and the personnel panel on the right. We put three lists in the control panel. The first one is data list. Users can import provided template and candidate graphs. Users can also remove them. The second one is channel list. Users can turn on display of specific channels. The last one, personnel list, shows all selected individuals. By the way, we made the control panel collapsible so that users can focus on other The middle part mainly serves for comparing graphs in the organization level, so that users can explore the relationship between individuals. The upper part, called frequency section, indicates the frequency of each channel. We can change the data range to display or adjust offset of time of each graph on top. The lower part, called Activity section, contains three tabs, Time, Space, and Structure. Each of them visualize a specific dimension of data. I will explain them in a demonstration later. The right part contains charts about individuals. The goal of this part is to compare individuals from different graphs. To this part, I must select individuals I'm interested in, activity section. In the top, I could read how their activities are distributed in all channels. In the bottom, I could read how they spent money, where did they travel, and so on. And most importantly, I can compare between individuals, so I can confirm if someone people is similar to other individuals. Okay, here is a demonstration. Now I'm going to give a demonstration. I will show you how to find the candidate graph that resembles the template graph most. First, we need to import all graphs in the control panel by clicking the plus button and click this graphs. In the Structure tab in Activity panel, we could find two individuals trade and communicate with each other in the template graph. This pattern also occurs in the first, second, and third candidate graph. Now, have a look at the Time tab in Activity panel. It's obvious that in template graph, there are some tourists. They only travel, but they don't communicate with others. We can also find that in the template graph, four people communicate with each other all over the year. The same pattern also exists in the first and second graph. By the evidence so far, we can preclude the third, fourth, and fifth candidate graphs. I can remove them in the control panel. Now we have the first graph and the second graph. In the organization panel, we can say that template graph indicates a peak in both phone and email channel 
at the same time around October. Only the second graph has a peak in the same height. In conclusion, the second candidate graph resembles the template graph most. However, when we select two individuals at the same place, we found that they have different demographics distribution. This indicates that the second graph may be not the responsible group. Therefore, we develop a workflow to find the real responsible group among the very large graph. In this part, I will discuss our analytics workflow for identifying the real responsible group. We developed the workflow based on our experience. It works better with a database, for example, an SQL database, because we need to efficiently find edges or nodes satisfying specific conditions. First, we make an empty graph as a starting point. Second, we are supposed to find several nodes with distinct features in the template graph. By summarizing these nodes' features, we can find similar individuals in the very large graph and we can mark these nodes as matched. Then, we can repeat the process but start with nodes connected to match it nodes. Stop the process when all nodes in the template graph are matched. Gradually, we can construct a subgraph that resembles the template graph most. In this way, we find out the subgraph representing the real responsible group. Here's our result. You can notice that they just look the same. You can check it out in our system by adding the subgraph called Candidate in the control panel. Furthermore, our system is able to create graphs, and we designed a data query interface by which user can add edges and nodes to created graphs. Therefore, this workflow can be achieved in our system. In the last part, I will summarize our works and discuss about limitations and future works. Overall, for Mini Challenge 1, we designed and developed a visual analytics system that is capable of comparing and matching graphs. Based on the system, we introduced a workflow that helps users efficiently find a subgraph in a very large graph. Our system is not perfect. There are several limitations in our system. First, our system only visualizes actual data. It doesn't visualize uncertainty. Therefore, users have to make judgment based on their knowledge. Second, the workflow is not automated so users have to follow steps manually. It's worthwhile trying to automate this process. Last, many components in our system are not interactive. It would be better if we could add more interaction. That's all my speech. Thanks for your time and attention. If you want to try out our system, you can access the link here. The source code is available at GitHub. Visit our website to know more works from us. Okay, thank you. Now we're going to start our Q&A with our uh, presenter, Liu Yu Cheng from Shandong University. Uh, the first question uh, from Discord uh, is, uh, first, it was a very interesting Hello, workflow. Uh, I wonder how fast the response time of your system is, especially for the large graph, and what kind of acceleration approaches did you consider or implement? Well, thanks for the question. Uh, first, I, I think the response time you said means the query time. Is that yeah, right? Yeah, I, I think so. Yeah, because that's the, uh, because 
uh, the query is implemented via a server. Uh, we put the all the graph data in an SQL database, and we put that database in a small server in DigitalOcean. Yeah, but that server now is shutting down because it requires our money to maintain. Yeah, uh, actually, it doesn't uh, need some uh, expertise to do that because uh, it's the database itself is only used for retrieval the nodes and the edges. So it's just a simple server and we don't use any kind of acceleration inside it. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, <clears throat> yeah, well, there's a follow-up question. Um, did you consider, instead of using the SQL database, using a, a specialized graph database like Neo4j? Oh, yeah. That's a good question. I will try the Neo4j, but soon I found that many functions provided by it is not required in our workflow. Our workflow only, a, well, our workflow only needs some function that's uh, like retravel ages or filter ages by specific conditions. So yeah, using Neo4j maybe and work in the future, but in this workflow, it's not required. Okay. Yeah. One question I had was I noticed that your submission mm -hmm. had a particular focus on the temporal uh, comparisons mm -hmm. of the subgraphs. Um, could you explain um, why you decided to, to really focus in on those time aspects? Oh, well, it is because time is an important factor when you compare to or match two graphs. Well, because if you just ignore the time aspect, you will find that you, ha you can hardly <laughs> uh, differentiate, you can hardly match two graphs. And with time, we can do many type of charts, like you can do something uh, scatter points. Yeah, you can do something like, like heat map. So we use time because it's important. Yeah. yeah. OK, thank you. Yeah, I can tell you um, from the generating the data side to getting the temporal aspects correct um, was also some of the most difficult. So. Thank you um, very much. Um, again, if there are more uh, questions for a presenter, please um, follow up with those on the chat. Uh, sure. We are going to go ahead with our next presentation. OK. Thank you. Okay, our next presentation is also going to be an honorable mention uh, winner from Mini Challenge One. Um, and this is a team from the University of Constance, a longtime participant in the VAST Challenge. Uh, their honorable mention uh, this year will be for a custom tool supporting visual comparison. And um, now we will queue up their video. My name is David and I'm a student at the University of Constance. Today I'm representing my team and I'm going to present the main parts of our tool we built to solve this year's VAST Mini Challenge 1, which deals with network data. Our title is SumRaps, something with graphs, visual analytics of network data. The focus of the presentation will be on the tool itself, 
So at first I'm giving you a short overview of how we started with the template and the subgraphs. Afterwards I'm giving you an overview of the tool and walking you through the views we created to analyze the different channels provided in the dataset. To summarize the presentation I will be talking about the lessons we learned while analyzing the dataset of the challenge. The idea behind our custom layout is to place nodes with similar characteristics in the same area of the canvas. As the travel graph was reasonable to handle in size, we started by adding the five locations at the very top. Underneath, we can find all the persons who show activity in the travel channel, whereas people with the same travel route are colorized in the same color. In the center, we can find all the demographic nodes encoded in red, and at the very bottom, we can find all the persons who only show activity in the demographics channel. Uh, then at the bottom left, we placed all the persons who are connected in the communication channels by using a random layout. We also detected some outliers, which means people who only <coughs> appear in one or two channels or show completely different activity compared to all the other persons. So we placed them around this area here. So that means with this representation we get already an overview of all the persons and how they are connected in the network. And moreover, if we find another subgraph that looks like the template, we should get a really similar layouting in the node like in the node link diagram. So now with the node link diagram in hand, we can place it in a tool. We used D3 to build the tool with some interactions around it. So part A shows the filter buttons for different channels, which allows us to show or hide specific edges. With the controls in part B, we can, for example, animate the node link diagrams, or we can switch between the views or even show a layout of two or six subgraphs side by side, which we will see later. So, so far we didn't cover the temporal dimension and to solve this we added an activity stream at the bottom and we get this for each graph that is currently displayed. What we see here is the activity for each channel aggregated on a daily level. So that already reveals a lot of patterns that appear in both of the graphs and can be used for comparisons. To investigate these patterns even more, we added a brushing functionality, so that means we can select spe specific time ranges in both of the graphs in separate, and then analyze the activities during the days. The tool also allows us to investigate all six graphs in a single view side by side. So here we can already see that based on the activity which is happening over the year that the first three graphs share similar patterns whereas the last three subgraphs show different activity. Another feature we added is the encoding of the frequency in the communication network directly on the edges in the graph. So the thickness of an edge between two person nodes represents the frequency, how often the communication happens over time. This reveals communication clusters with higher and lower frequencies. To augment the node link diagram even more, we added an encoding of the specific point in time when the communication happens, which is encoded in a color scale. Now the colorization of the edges shows us again communication clusters based on the temporal dimension. As I already mentioned, the tool allows to show the visualization of each subgraph, including the template, in a grid layout side by side, which makes a, compar a comparison much easier. So now with the node link diagrams, we can already compare the six graphs and we can immediately, immediately see that subgraph 4 and subgraph 5 looks different compared to the others. Before we continue now with the travel channel, I will show a quick live demo of the tool itself. In the current view, we are comparing the template graph against subgraph 1. As already mentioned, in the filters, we can toggle, for example, the demographic edges and focus on the rest of the graph. In the settings, 
we have the availability of encoding the frequency, encoding the centrality or map the time to a color scale as already mentioned. At the bottom we can brush for interesting patterns and compare them in the two graphs. We also can switch between the different subgraphs and select for example subgraph 2. Now I'm going to present the way how we visualize the travel data. In the displayed example, we see a single travel activity of person 73. For the representation and the visualization, we used a rectangle with a gradient from the color of the source location, which is orange, and to the color of the target location, which is purple in this case. The width of the rectangle represents the duration of the trip itself. In some cases, we discovered negative duration information in the data and used black rectangles for an easy visual detection. If we scale this up now and plot such a rectangle for each trip, we get a timeline for the travel activity of a single subgraph. Here we can see again the groups of people who are using the same travel routes and can start to reason when and where people meet each other. Moreover, if we look at the person with the ID 75, we can detect rectangles with odd-looking gradients that overlap. This also happens in other travel routes and arises the question if the data is wrong or even purposely manipulated. By following the colors that represent the location, we can check consecutive and non-consecutive routes. For example, the person with the ID 41 travels at first from orange to purple and follows with a trip from yellow to orange. Here we can start again to reason if the data is wrong or purposely manipulated. Overall, we get an effective representation of the travel data that scales up to the size of the presented subgraphs. If we toggle the layout in the tool, we can again compare the travel data for each subgraph side by side. This allows again a visual comparison of the data. To get a better idea now of the visualization, I'm going back to the tool sum wraps and give you again a quick live demo. If we select another view, which is the travels view, we get a representation of the travel data for each subgraph and can compare it side by side. As already mentioned, we have two data points that look wrong and by hovering over it, we can further inspect it. So after we got now some insights of our tool sum wraps, I want to talk shortly about the large graph data set and some lessons we learned while solving the challenge. At first, we tried to extract selected subgraphs from the large graph data set and displayed it with the tool. But uh, then we quickly faced the limits of node link diagrams and the difficulty of extracting a suitable subset of nodes from the graph for further analysis. So then we also calculated embeddings of the large graph and experienced the high requirements of computational resources for the calculation on large graph datasets. But uh, at the end with the sum reps as an exploratory visual analytics tool, it was still possible to abstract knowledge from the provided big graph data by using knowledge we gained from the template network. So if you want to check out our tool and explore the dataset, feel free to visit the provided demo link of some reps. And uh, thanks for having me and I hope you enjoyed the presentation. Bye. Okay, um, we're back and I'm here with Udo Schlegel. I hope I got that name uh, yeah. close to correct. <laughs> Thank you. Um, very nice uh, video, very nice presentation. Um, I'd like to start um, with a question that, that I had. At the very end of your presentation, you noted um, how you quickly ran into the limits of node link diagrams. Uh, of course, whenever there's a graph visualization, um, we you know that folks think about the that node link uh, view 
So um, how did you work through that and get over those limits? Um, okay, so I answer for David. And um, in the beginning, so the most critical part about the node link diagram was because um, we, didn't, we didn't have a good um, layout for the nodes and all the stuff. And um, David and especially, yeah, especially David and Pablo um, tried a lot of different layouts to tackle um, moving all these different nodes um, all together and show or, yeah, removing the visual clutter. Um, and basically, what they did in the end was to um, create an own um, layout system and own layout for the points. And um, which works for the small graphs, but um, yeah, only for the few smaller graphs which are provided by the challenge. Mm -hmm. So yeah, this was right. one of the limitations. <laughs> yeah, I know um, you also mentioned having running into some computational issues with the large graph. And I know as a reviewer, I'm glad that um, none of the submitters this year attempted to visualize the whole of the, uh, the large graph, um, which, which would have had just too much clutter. Um, can you talk a little bit about uh, the methods that your team uh, used to overcome those computational limits? Um, in the end, or so in the beginning, we tried to use um, Craft2Vec and Note2Vec and a lot of other um, embedding uh, methods. And um, yeah. Um, it took way too much time to for yeah for the big graph to search for the smaller graphs or even um, to get a good embedding for it, and so um, in the end it was a bit um, yeah sampled and looked only in a few parts and um, yeah we just tried to make the large graph smaller and then try <laughs> again <laughs> yeah okay. Thank you very much. Um, we're running a bit behind schedule. So in the interest of time, I'm going to move ahead to our next sure. presentation. So thank you again. Thank you for your time. Okay, uh, our next presentation in this session two is going to be an honorable mention uh, for the team from uh, SAS Institute. And um, this uh, uh, honorable mention was given for a clear articulation of their analytical process. I know um, this is another team that participates um, you know, many years in the vast challenge. And um, as they always do, provided a, a really detailed explanation of their full uh, process. And so um, looking forward to seeing their talk. Welcome. My name is Falko Schultz. This presentation is about to summarize our findings for the VAST Challenge 2020. Mini Challenge 1 is about the scenario where the Center of Global Cyber Strategy researchers have used the data donated by the White Hat groups to create anonymized profiles of the groups. One such profile has been identified by the CGCS as most likely to resemble the structure of the group who accidentally caused the internet outage. While our answer sheet, shown here, contains more detailed information, let's Let's walk through some of the key findings. The interface used here is the SAS main explorational interface for analyzing and visualizing any kind of data. Let's start by looking at the provided graph template. We have been asked to examine the CGCS records and identify those groups who most closely resemble the identified profile. We started the analysis by inspecting the provided template graph as shown here in the middle. Some noteworthy patterns were also identified. To make anal analysis easier, let's split off the financial information of the main graph. This will make the topology easier to understand and visualize. As we look into the graph, we notice that person 39 buys products from person 67. 
after early communication all the way back in February, January. We also noticed that person 39 travels to country number five all the way back in October 2020. And we also noticed that purchases are more frequent in June, July, shown here on the right. Purchases are made in amounts of either 100, 300, 600 or 800 dollars. And person 48, uh, 41 acts as a hub between communicating cluster on the top here and the travel cluster on the bottom. Let's look at the financial graph shown here on the right. Some indirectly connected individuals such as person 57 and 44 in the middle have unusual high um, money transfer. Person 44, for example, receives $200,000 income before taxes, while person 57 has a $200,000 in personal tax payments. Person 57, for example, is also indirectly connected by two edges to both 39 and 67. The amount of money paid in taxes does not always correlate with income. As part of the analysis, we decided to search for these noteworthy patterns and see whether we can find any similarities to the template in candidate graph 1, 2, and 3. With these features in mind, the composition of the candidate graphs and the topology were visualized in this report page to facilitate searching for some of these same features. This page shows the comparison of topology of the template and the candidate graphs with financial edges shown separately. While the template graph in mind, with the template graph in mind, a visual comparison of the topology structure shows a close similarity to candidate graph one and two, as well as three. All show similar purchasing pattern as well as some unusual high financial transactions. Candidate graph four is missing a purchasing between the two individuals, like the one presented in the template. Candidate graph five is missing the cluster of non-travel communicators. Let's now look into the attribute comparison. Comparing the node and edge composition of the network does not reveal much more than the network structure does not already, but the temporal comparison does provide more helpful differences. In particular, the communication peaks found in the template are also found in candidate graph one and two, and to some lesser extent in candidate graph three. The summertime window of purchasing found in the template is also visible in graph one and two, and to a shorter window in candidate graph number three. From this initial comparison, candidate graph four and five seem to be quite different. Candidate graph three has some several differences in the financial related areas of the network. So that leaves candidate graph one and two both seem reasonable similar to the temporal patterns of the template with candidate graph one appealing to align best after the first visual assessment. Many of the visualized features of the graph help narrow focus to candidate graph one and two. By establishing a topology of relevant subgraph structures and attributes, you were able to check for pattern matches in the template and candidate graphs for a more analytical approach to evaluating similarities. A few of the financial, financial and re travel related patterns shown here in blue showed a higher incidence of matches between the template graph and candidate graph one. But many of the more communication centric patterns shown in purple showed a higher number of matches between template graph, template graph and candidate graph two. Given that the communication connections are more informative about the informative about the how an event between people occurred, we are inclined to bias towards candidate graph two being a stronger match. Additionally, two people communicating, buying, selling, and communicating within the week, shown here in yellow, is a relatively rare pattern in the full graph, and it is only shared between the template and the candidate graph number two. In the next section, we will explore how such pattern can be analyzed on any size network using SAS via. Hi. My name is Steve Herrenberg. I'm going to walk through some of how we leverage network analytics from SAS via to find subgraphs of interest in the candidate graphs and the full graph. The pattern match statement in the network procedure 
can be used to find all the subgraphs that are the same as or similar to a given pattern graph. One pattern we looked for was two people who, within a week, communicate, buy and sell together, then communicate again. Finding subgraphs that match this pattern means that the subgraphs will have the appropriate node and link relationships in addition to meeting the fuzzy temporal constraints defined on the attributes. First, consider the topology of this pattern. Here we are specifying the set of links that represent this pattern. We have two links between nodes 0 and 1 to represent the two communication events. We also have a link between nodes 0 and 2 to represent a buy event, and a link between node 1 and 2 to represent a sell event. Next, we impose conditions on the attribute values of these links. The SAS function compiler, FCMP, gives you the ability to specify a set of functions to add user-defined conditions that the subgraph must satisfy to be considered a match. A link filter can be used to specify a required condition on a link. We use this to require that the links between nodes 0 and 1 must be a phone call or an email type to represent a communication event. Similarly, we required that the links to node 2 be either a buy event or sell event link type. A link pair filter can be used to specify a required condition on every pair of links. Here, we require that the buy and sell event happen at the same time to ensure they are the same event. Also, we require that the buy and sell links and the communication links are within one week of each other. A MASH filter can be used to specify a required condition on the entire subgraph. Here we use it to enforce that we have a sequential order of events, that a communication happens, a buy and sell event happens, and then another communication happens in that order. Finally, the pattern match statement in the network procedure can be invoked. We specify the input data set, the query graph that defines the topology, and the FCMP functions that we just defined. We found that the statement took around 400 seconds to complete on the full graph, which contained 124 million links. Interestingly, we found this pattern in only one of the candidate graphs, and it also occurred only 43 times in the full graph. We used pattern match like this to find other patterns across the candidate graphs and the full graph, enabling us to quantify the differences between the candidate graphs and identify regions of interest in the full graph. Taking the search results and patterns into account, we can now visualize subgraphs in order to understand how identified nodes relate to each other. Let's start by visualizing the progressive narrowing of nodes to indicate the template presence against three rarest patterns. We selected the rarest of the patterns given the number of matches. In particular, pattern number one represents pairs who engage in buy and sell activities at least five times. Pattern number two represents a pair that sequentially communicate, buy, sell, then communicate within the span of a week. And finally, a unique individual in a group of three communicating at least 10 times. Each pattern was analyzed individually to see subgraphs formed by only keeping the nodes matching the pattern and any of the edges between. We can select one pattern at a time to visualize. Additionally, any seed nodes that were directly connected to a node that match one of the patterns are included in yellow to see which of the seeds is involved in a template match. You may also notice that some of the nodes appear in all three of the patterns. By filtering the nodes to only the set that were found to match all three patterns, a much smaller set of nodes were identified, and the subgraph is here shown in the top right corner. And from those nodes, we found that 5, 6, 1, 4, 2, 8, here in orange, 6, 2, 0, 7, 9, 1 in green, and 4, 6, 2, 2, 7, 8 here in blue, have direct connection to the two seed nodes here shown in yellow. 
This leads us to believe that these nodes are very likely to be connected to subgraphs that match the template. To make our best guess at finding the match for a responsible party, we started from the six people shown here that were matches for all of the three rarest pattern we devised for identifying the presence of the template. When looking at their procurement channel, here shown on the left, some of these nodes have similar temporal patterns over the course of the year, which further suggests they were involved in the same group activity. In particular, 647740, here on the bottom, is a potential match for template node 67 due to both being a member of purchasing pair that does not have any travel activity. Additionally, the two 570191 as well as 561 and 428 are potential matches for the template known node 39 in the template which is a member of the purchasing pair with travel activity. Between them, the one ending with 428 here is connected to one of the seed nodes, therefore potentially indicating a higher chance of involvement. I want to conclude this analysis by showing a visualization representing the entire graph. Note that this graph is clustered and nodes in this visualization represent clusters of hundreds of nodes. Further analysis, including things like community detection, can help further narrow down groups of interest and similar social behavior. Okay, thank you to our presenters from SAS Institute. I'm now here with Steve Herrenberg, who's going to ask uh, to answer a few questions about their uh, submission. Um, so I'll kick things off with a, a question. Uh, I noticed as you were walking through um, the sort of process of setting up that pattern search, um, yeah. it, it, and you were showing the code for that, um, is there a way to set up that pattern visually? Not at the moment, but it's something we're looking towards in the future. We've done some uh, internal demos. We've actually done some work with um, contact tracing on this, and mm. that's definitely a direction we're looking to moving towards. Uh, but right now, it's all just um, you give it as links table and the attributes that you want and the conditions on those attributes if you have fuzzy constraints. Right. Yeah, I, I know um, you always have a uh, a challenge, um, you know, in in fitting the data into your um, software. Um, it's a commercial software. So, uh, do you run into times when, you know, like this, where maybe it uh, the questions or the types of challenges that are posed lead you to to sort of thinking of different features that you'd want to introduce? Yeah, definitely. And that's um, one of the benefits you get out of doing challenges like these. Um, they can introduce you to some feature uh, in your software that would improve user experience. Um, they can show where you could improve performance and stress the systems in ways that you wouldn't. It's hard to stress without uh, either real data in the, mm -hmm. or doing a challenge like this. And this was certainly a challenge because the template graph was quite large and that was a fairly new experience for us. That's why we broke the problem down a bit in the uh, smaller patterns we looked for. Yeah, so in addition to that, I mean, what other um, major challenges do you think you had in um, ingesting, handling, visualizing the large uh, graph data? Uh, it was, yeah, it was certainly, I mean, difficult from a variety of perspectives. Um, you know, this, the way we did this challenge with pattern matching is, I mean, in worst case, it can grow exponentially as your pattern increases. So you have to be limited to fairly small patterns, which was one strategy we did. Um, 
if you start getting too big, it can take you know way too long on data this size. Um, and the other challenge too was that the the size of the template graph, um, we wanted to identify what was important. It would have been nice if we had a way to do some fuzzy temporal conditions. So you could say like, here's a template graph. I don't want an exact match, but I'd like something close to this. And we do have some ways of uh, doing things in parallel if you specify different patterns, but um, that's definitely a, a future area we'd like to get into, but far, far more challenging. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Um, we are a, um, a little bit over time and we'd like to, to wrap up our session um, today with a feedback session. So um, if there are further questions for um, Steve or, or the team from SAS, um, please put those in the uh, Discord or YouTube chat. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, <laughs> go ahead. Uh, no, I was just going to introduce you, Diane, but uh, go ahead. Okay, um, so my name is Diane Staley. Um, I'm group lead here at Lincoln Laboratory and part of the VAST Challenge Committee. Um, what we wanted to do today was to hear a little bit from you uh, as far as your feedback on, on this year's VAST Challenge. Uh, we only have a few minutes. Um, so if, if you do have immediate thoughts on some of these questions, um, please put them into the live chat or you can also email us afterwards to share your thoughts with us. Uh, so some of the questions that we have for you this year, um, we, we always want to know, um, did you try out the challenge? Uh, what did you like about it? What are the things that you wanted to be different or you thought that could be improved upon? Um, if you didn't try it or didn't, or you did um, put some time in, um, but didn't submit an entry, why did you choose not to submit? Um, we wanted to know if you liked the community-driven data challenge um, and if it would be something you would want to participate in in the future, um, either as uh, putting together a submission or as helping us to generate the data um, to create the challenge in the first place. Um, we also want to hear your stories about what you learned uh, along the way, um, what you tried, what you didn't try, um, how you use the data, um, any ideas that you had that came out of working on the challenge that you wanted to share with us. Uh, we also want to hear what you thought about the data. Was it, um, were there unintended things that you found in the data set? Um, was the data um, too easy, too hard? What was the level of difficulty? Um, and we always want to hear from you what kind of challenges would be interesting for you to work on in future events, um, different scenarios or different kinds of data um, that you would like to work with. Um. Yeah, thanks, Diane. And so it, for any of the folks, um, you know, following along on YouTube, you can post your, some of your feedback in the chat right now. Um, if you'd like a few more minutes to think about it, you can um, write up your feedback and send it to the email that is on the slide right now. Or you can also um, seek out and uh, find one of uh, Fast Challenge Committee members uh, to uh, provide that feedback um, directly to us through, through Discord or through um, um, any means. So, see there's a couple of uh, um, folks um, typing their feedback now um, from our first presenter in the Mini Challenge uh, 1 session. Um, 
presenter is saying it was a very difficult challenge uh, and that a lot of time was spent to form the solution. Um, they had to try many methods because the graph was very large and hyper-connected, um, sort of not having a, a, knowing where to start. Um, and they noted that they thought it was a good example of a graph in the real world. Um, we appreciate that, that feedback. Uh, of course, we always um, take pride in trying to make the data sets as realistic as we can, even though it's um, always uh, all synthetic data. Um, so appreciate that. Yeah, and, and we also appreciate the comments that it's a, a good realistic example. Um, certainly, these are the kinds of problems that we do see in the real world, and, and it is hard, and that's that's why we put them out there. I really did think our mini challenge one um, was one of the most difficult challenges that we've um, put out in a vast challenge um, in my memory. So it's um, we were certainly aiming for it to be uh, very difficult this year. And and we were I, I was very impressed um, with the high quality of submissions and um, the number of teams that that really uh, got answers correct um, in um, the many challenges as well. I know that this year uh, we also tried something new which was at last year's conference uh, in Vancouver, we asked folks to come up and sign up and take home a few items, um, which then they, they would use to take photos and send their photos in, um, which was eventually became our mini challenge to data set. Um, first, I wanna thank everyone who participated um, by taking those items, by taking the photos and returning them um, to us it was a lot of fun to see those um, those submissions come in. Some people were very creative in how they um, they, they got that data, um, and we really enjoyed taking it then and and um, making it into a challenge. And so, um, if you liked that um, that aspect of it and would like to be sort of part of the community that that generates the vast challenge data in the future. Um, you know, please send us a note and let us know, um, and we can try to design challenges like that again in the future. So it looks like we have another comment in the chat. Um, it was a bit frustrating. Um, it was an agreement with the first comments that it was difficult because the graph was very big and it was frustrating, um, but that it was a good learning experience about how to work better on big graphs and, and trying out some different methods and learning about their limitations. Um, so thank you, Alexis, for that feedback. Um, it seems that the, the challenge was difficult, but it was also something that gave folks um, some good experiences in working with. While we're waiting for a few uh, folks, I can see there's some, some uh, typing, some comments coming through in the chat. Uh, I wanna remind everyone that our next session uh, will start in uh, about 20 minutes. Um, to switch over to session three, um, we're going to have a great panel of um, participants, uh, past participants in the VAST challenge, who will be talking about how they use the VAST challenge outside of the VAST challenge. So what it means um, um, to them in their academic work, uh, in their professional work, and so forth. And so um, please continue and, and join us there for the panel. And then we're also in the next session going to have uh, a presentation from an award winner for Mini Challenge 3. Uh, there was another comment that um, said their team spent a lot of time familiarizing and exploring the data uh, and, and just figuring out the methods in the last two weeks. Uh, I think that's a common Thing we hear from participants that um, the the parts of the challenge that take the most time are not the, the developing the visualizations um, sometimes, um, but um, by spending time uh, working with the data before even getting it into visualization. 
<laughs> also, uh, the next comment is, it is a good challenge during COVID lockdown, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> Um, so I guess follow up question to that. Um, did folks feel like they were able to spend more time on it than previous years, uh, less time in previous years because of the lockdown? Now, yeah, I already see one um, person before you had finished your question saying that that they use the vast challenge to bring their colleagues together once a week for their meetings and uh, have a video conference. So it's that's great to hear. Um, I know as a committee we were um you know a, a little bit worried of course whether there would be the same level of participation or more participation both in the challenge and in the conference but i already see that there's uh, quite a few people participating in the chat and i think we got more submissions this year even than last year uh, so we really appreciate uh, everybody working on the challenge and sending their submissions Uh, so Steve uh, put in a comment, has the VAST challenge ever considered releasing uh, baseline analytics to help teams get started and overcoming that initial uh, barrier to entry? Uh, so I guess, Steve, um, what do you mean here by baseline analytics? Um, do you mean sort of like a, a toolkit of sort of, you know, a basic set of graph analytics? Yes, I also, um, I, I don't know if we've ever had the um, idea to, to provide a, a visualization of the data to, as a starting point. Um, but one thing we've talked about, we haven't really um, decided, but is that we might use some data from a previous uh, VAST challenge and renew it for uh, a new VAST challenge year. Um, that would give us a chance to to uh, look at that data again and see how the visual analytics have developed over the uh, intervening time. And that could be an interesting way of seeing a baseline. Yeah, and I, I would add to that too that um, part of the challenge is also figuring out new ways to, to work with data at that scale and try to figure out what to do with it. So we're also hoping that we see some, some different approaches um, from the community that maybe we haven't thought of. Um, so we, I think we leave them intentionally open-ended for some of that reason. Okay, and there was one comment saying the person spent a lot of time uh, representing the data set in, in Neo4j to leverage the graph algorithms that come along with that graph database. Um, and then, then realize the computational limits on the, on the laptop. I can say that on our mini challenge one submissions, that was a common uh, comment, which was if, if they had, if there was one thing the teams wanted more, it was more processing power for that data set. Um, so um, definitely um, that commenter, they're, they're not alone. Um, I know we have just a few moments left uh, because we have to close this session so that we can start um, the preparations for uh, session three. Um, I'll just read the one final comment um, from uh, Steve Gomez again. Um, something that might help the teams get s uh, some answer, even if it isn't performing well at first. Um, it's a suggestion that he's seen for other ambitious challenge problems. Um, I, I will emphasize that uh, when the committee and when the reviewers look at the submissions, uh, we do not judge uh, the submissions just on who got the right answers. Um, because we think that um, the challenge is about the, the visualizations and about the development of those. Um, getting the right answers is a bonus, um, but it is. Uh, we're not giving a, a awards for, for answering the solutions, but for developing novel visualizations. So um, as you work on those these challenges in the future, just keep that in mind. Diane, do you have any um, closing comments? Uh, no closing comments uh, aside from, uh, if you haven't had a chance to, to put your feedback into the chat, um, please do make sure 
uh, to send us a note over email. Again, the email address is in the slides. Um, we do very much want to hear your feedback, um, you know, just on the, the details of the challenge uh, this year, uh, the data, the scenario, and, and how you use the vast challenge in, in practice. Um, you know, it's, I, I like the, the thought about using uh, the vast challenge as a way to bring the community together. And we hear from folks sometimes that they um, use the challenge as part of their coursework. So we want to hear all of those kinds of details and all of your stories. Yes, absolutely. Okay, thank you again for um, staying on for this um, feedback session. Um, and uh, please come back for session three in about 15 minutes. Thank you all. Data videos are quite popular nowadays. They usually show changes in the data. However, Creating a data video requires multiple skills, and the process is usually laborious and iterative. Our approach focuses on automatic and interactive visual enhancement of important changes in time series data with data video. Hands-on cybersecurity training represents a domain where visual analytics can significantly improve the impact of teaching process. We describe this new application domain and introduce a conceptual model that can serve as a framework for the development of analytical visualizations. Unified training lifecycle will be discussed from the perspective of different user roles. We present TransFizz a design study that is proposed to analyze and integrate close and distant reading of multiple translations. TransFizz presents the overview of the collection to capture global patterns that is facilitated by the ADM web matrix. TransFizz integrates a detailed view to explore interesting path of alignments. We also propose the TLC view to examine and explore the terms of the user-selected path to justify and reason the AD analysis. Uh, testing environment for continuous color maps. Many other fields in the computer science do it, we should do it too. With our work, we introduce the approach of using test functions as a standard evaluation method. We present a test suite for continuous color maps implemented in the CCC tool. Adapt the test to your requirements at the interactive testing section and observe them at the testing evaluation section. Entities and their changing relationships can be modeled more precisely as temporal hypergraphs. But hypergraph models are difficult to explore and refine. By leveraging domain-specific geometric deep learning models and a new multi-level hypergraph visualization, our technique allows for the direct integration of domain knowledge into the machine learning process. The multivariate hypergraph model structure can be analyzed in different abstraction levels. Simultaneously, experts can integrate their domain knowledge on the fly and then explore the refined machine learning model. Attention mechanisms